If you've ever had the joy of driving in the rain, you know how much of a necessity wipers often are. That many different cars have many different speeds and many different ways of applying them, but in general you'll find three different outcomes no matter the amount of speeds nor no matter how good the wipers are. First, the wipers are too fast. Generally this happens whenever there's a light mist or a light rain, and it seems like all the settings are just too quick, that it just activates the wipers just a little bit too much for the amount of rain. Or there's the sweet spot. There's whenever the amount of rain matches the speed of the wipers almost exactly, and it seems like they're perfectly in sync. And then there's the deluge, the downpour, those thunderstorms that crop up and it seems like no matter how fast the wipers go, they never exactly do the job that they're supposed to do. That it's in general these three outcomes that we see. And certainly there is one goal, one end point, that there is something that the wipers are trying to do. Restore our sight. Restore our ability to see. And many times they do it, sometimes they don't. And yet, we want to see, we need to see, we need to see the way that we're headed. And all too, all too often we hear that there is this analogy of sight that is used for a life of faith. But whenever it comes to that life of faith, are we using our sight well? Do we feel like we have it all, that we're able to see the Lord? Or do we feel a little bit like we're Bartimaeus? We started off this morning with a reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, and we know that his job is essentially to speak words of encouragement, words of hope to the house of Israel because they're in exile at the very moment. They need to know that the Lord still cares for them, that he has not forsaken them. And indeed, that's what he does. And we see in this particular passage, he's doing exactly that. He's speaking these words of encouragement, trying to give them hope to let them know that the Lord is there. That he tells them at the very beginning, the Lord has delivered them, that he's delivered the remnant. But if he just stopped there, likely it would have fallen on deaf ears. Because they would have laughed at Jeremiah and said that he isn't getting the full picture because obviously the Lord hasn't delivered them to the fullest extent that they desire. And so then Jeremiah continues on. He tells them that the Lord is there, that he's going to deliver them, that he is going to gather them from all the ends of the earth. The widow, the orphan, that all of those that are blind and lame, he will count as those amongst the ones that he is saving. That we are told that he is going to go to all the places of the earth because he is as a father and that Ephraim is dear to him. And so the reality of what God is showing is that he's not just in just this small little microcosm somewhere else, but he's very much present. He's present to every land, every place, that he's going to gather them all together. But it isn't even enough to say that the Lord is present in every place, that even often preschoolers can tell you that. But what else Jeremiah is telling us, that he's in every time as well, that he's the God of the past, the God of the present, God of the future. He has delivered the remnant. He will deliver them now, and he's delivering them again. And that is why the responsorial psalm is so potent at this moment. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy because the Lord has done great things. The Lord is doing great things, and the Lord will continue to do great things in the future. We move on to the second reading from the letter to the Hebrews, and we are reminded about the high priesthood. Now, as the letter to the Hebrews would be addressed to the Jewish community in particular, they're all too familiar about the role of the high priest. But now it's being adopted in a different way, because within our Catholic faith and tradition, we know the priesthood to still be a part of our faith and of our religion. And, in fact, it's still much the same, that this is a representative, this is one that stands before God, that offers up sacrifices, that offers up gifts and oblation, so that the Lord can restore them, remove from them their sinfulness, and bring about life from death. That this is very much the same. And we continue on and we hear about this reality that even the high priest is very familiar that he is supposed to deal with all the people that he ministers to with patience and with understanding because he himself is also a sinner, that he's offering up offerings for himself as well as on behalf of the people. And as it continues on, it's just a simple and beautiful reminder that this calling is not something that they just simply assume as one job amongst many, but it is something that few are chosen for, and yet nonetheless, it's a beautiful job and vocation nonetheless. But it comes in the very same lineage, whether it's in the old high priesthood in the Jewish community, whether it's in the lineage of Aaron, or even in the lineage of Melchizedek. 
the high priesthood is here, and it continues to remind us of Christ and his work amongst us. Then we finally move on to the gospel according to Mark, and we hear Jesus is traveling through Jericho with this large crowd, and this man, Bartimaeus, he encounters and hears that Jesus is coming his way, and he's filled with excitement. And we know this excitement is there because he starts to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. He cries out, and notice what happens. Initially, the reception of the crowd isn't all that great. That they start to rebuke him, they start to push him to the side, as they've done so many times before. That they just don't want the inconvenience of dealing with this man. And yet, Bartimaeus isn't so easily deterred. Because we see that he starts to cry out all the more and all the more loudly, Jesus, Master, have pity on me. And so Jesus, he tells the crowd, go and call him. And so there are those that are able to call over to Bartimaeus and say, have courage and get up. Jesus is calling. And so this man, what does he do? He casts aside his cloak. He runs over. He springs up and he wants to meet the Lord. And he encounters the Lord right there, stands before him. And Jesus asks a simple question. What do you want me to do for you? Master, I want to see. And with that simple encouragement, the Lord sends him forward and says, Go your way. Your faith has saved you. And we know this is the Gospel of Mark because this key phrase immediately is there. It tells us that Jesus' word is not without effect. It sends him forward. And we're told that he immediately regained his sight. And then he followed on the way. What a beautiful and profound encounter that we hear about Bartimaeus, this man that had been blind for who knows how long, that he is able to encounter the Lord to voice his need and concern before him, and immediately it's cured, and he's able to follow the Lord that day. But here's the question. In this particular gospel, we actually see three different groups of people. Which one do we associate with? There's the first group that we may not all recognize all that much, but it's a group that is still present nonetheless. But it is the group that actually rebukes the blind man, that rebukes Bartimaeus, because they're all too caught up in the fanfare of being with Jesus, but really have no faith. That they've gone through each and every day kind of pushing the poor and the outcast to the side, not really wanting to be inconvenienced and not really wanting to have to tend to their needs. And so they continue to push them to the side, just saying, someone else will take care of this. Or just that they want them to be silent, to be out of sight and out of mind. But notice, this crowd that is rebuking Bartimaeus, even they had the ability to know that this is not what the Lord wanted. Throughout the Old Testament, it speaks of how the Lord favors even the widow, the orphan, the blind, and the lame, that the Lord always hears their cry. So the crowd there that day, they had no excuse it shows very clear they had no faith. They didn't want to be bothered with what their faith was telling them to do. But then there's a second part of that crowd. That that crowd, as we see it, Jesus, he instructs them and says, go and call him. And so there's a few that are willing to call to Bartimaeus. That they see that Jesus, he desires a relationship with him. And so they go forward to Bartimaeus. They encourage this relationship in exchange. They say, have courage and get up. The master is calling that they, in fact, recognize Jesus' voice, it is reaching out to Bartimaeus. They want to facilitate this exchange and this encounter. There's a good thing and a bad thing about being a, this part of the crowd. The good thing is they hear the voice of the Lord, that they recognize that there is a certain duty to those entrusted with the gospel. But there's a bad side to it as well, because this calling isn't just for Bartimaeus. It's for each of them as well, that they are supposed to have an intentional and personal relationship with Jesus, and yet they just simply want to encourage others to have that relationship. They really aren't invested 100% just yet, and so their faith is kind of split. They do have some faith. They recognize when Jesus is calling, they recognize his voice, but they don't really have that moment of encounter, that they're not making faith very personal just yet, and so they're kind of split. But what if I told you the person that was able to see the most clearly that day, the person with the most faith, the one who had their eyes of faith completely open that day, was not the crowd. It was Bartimaeus. What if I told you that is true? Because the reality is that whenever we behold these crowds, we might think, oh, they're following along the way, they're doing the right thing. And they are doing some good things along the way. 
but they're not actually going the full distance. They're not going to the fullest extent to what Jesus wants. Because Bartimaeus has something that they don't. He has the fullness of faith. And this fullness of faith, it is so powerful that we notice that he calls out to the Lord, and not just whenever it's favorable for him, not just whenever others are encouraging, but even when others are rebuking him, even whenever others are telling him to go sit down and shut up and because the Lord couldn't be bothered, that even in those moments, his faith persists. His faith carries him onward, that it continues to lead him, and eventually it leads him to fulfillment. Because there's this moment of exchange, and he asks the Lord for his sight. What does the Lord do? He restores it. He gives it back. But he is able to have pity on this man because of his faith. It's not just a little faith. It's no faith that can simply just be half and half, but it's rather a faith that is full. It led him to the Savior. And in fact, it is something that led him to even receive his physical sight. A miraculous occurrence. But notice, Jesus, he tells him, go on your way, your faith has saved you. This man doesn't go on his way. This man doesn't choose to go on his way. He threw that cloak of his old life aside, and rather he chose to adopt the way of life that the Savior had given to him that he wanted to be amongst his followers. He wanted to be following him along the way, that he cast aside that old way, threw it to the side where he had been sitting for so long, and said, now my way is Christ's way, and his way is mine. And we see that faith, it carries him in such a beautiful way. But my brothers and sisters, which one do we associate with? Are we the crowd that is rebuking, the crowd that is accepting, or are we seeking that intentional relationship with the Lord? Because, make no mistake about it, the crowd is often a place of comfort. That it is that place where we assume, by popularity, we shouldn't end up in the wrong place. But in fact, we see that that day, they weren't exactly doing what they were supposed to do. That yes, they did encourage someone along the way, but they started to excuse themselves in a real way as well. It's as if we start to tell ourselves that there's those few holy people, they've got it all figured out, but they have the time or they have the resources, or they've got that personal relationship, perhaps they're the the ones that are called to have that intentional relationship with God. And so we start to make excuses. Or we start to say, look at that priest or that seminarian or that religious. And we start to say, they have a calling. They've got that personal relationship with Jesus Christ and that intentional relationship as well, that they're the ones that are supposed to do that. It's not just them that are supposed to do that. It's not just Bartimaeus. It's every one of us, that each of us are called in a relationship. Each of us are called to have that moment where we are called forward to receive from Jesus the object of our heart's desire, that we are called to have our prayers answered. But how many of us have the courage to approach? How many of us have the courage to throw the old life aside? How many of us hear the voice of the Master and we say, that's not just for other people, that's for me as well. I want to hear the voice. I want to hear the one that is the consoler. I want to hear the great peacemaker. I want him speaking to me, not just everyone else. That's what Bartimaeus said that day. But how about us? Can we have the courage to speak to him? And one way that might be a sort of litmus test that we can apply to ourselves very readily is our use of the sacrament of reconciliation, because that defines a difference. Are we Bartimaeus? Are we the one who is willing to cross the threshold of the door of the confessional and approach the Lord and the one who will give us what we desire, even forgiveness and mercy? Are we willing to approach and be vulnerable for a moment? Or are we part of the crowd that just simply stays out and say, I'm just fine where I'm at. I don't need that relationship, or I'm not able to really understand it, or I don't have the time. Because we recognize, many times we might make excuses, we might tell ourselves, I'm seeing just fine. I'm at a distance, I see the Lord over there, and that's great. But what about if the Lord wants you closer? What if the Lord is actually telling us that we need to be awakened? What if he's telling us, actually, you're a little bit blind in this area because of weakness, because of anxiety, because of grief, because of all the things going on in your life? You're a little bit blind. Let me remove those things so you can see clearly. What if the Lord is saying that to you and I? What if he's actually encouraging us to go along the way? Where is the Lord reaching into your life and my life right at this moment and saying, let me remove this thing from you so you can see more clearly? Are you and I, whenever we hear that call to come forward, 
Are we courageous? Are we vulnerable? Are we willing to express our need to the Lord and to really open ourselves up so that He can do something great? Because there were differences that day. And there were differences in the way that everyone walked away from that experience. Maybe many of them were changed, but perhaps some of them weren't. Perhaps some of them still resented Bartimaeus. Perhaps some of them saw what happened and they say, well, he was a chosen one. Or perhaps there was Bartimaeus and his example for everyone who saw that encounter, who saw the way that he heard the voice of the Lord, who saw his persistence and his faith. And they said, that's for each and every one of us that we, in fact, can call out to the Lord so that all of our sinfulness, all of our weakness, all of the rain, all of the things that obscure our vision can be removed, and we can believe with hearts that are made new. Because, my brothers and sisters, it isn't just Bartimaeus that struggles with blindness sometimes. Each and every one of us do in our own unique way. But the question is, do we have the courage, do we have the faith to approach our Lord and to ask for healing, to ask for our sight, so that we can be made whole and made new. Jesus, whenever he encounters Bartimaeus, he gives him that beautiful reassurance. May each of us also receive that reassurance as well, to go our way, for our faith has saved us.